Coraline. A film that, while full of dark and twisted themes, characters, and atmosphere, for some reason feels so homey and comforting. This movie perfectly encapsulates the idea of a creepy, cozy film, and inspired so many films after that wanted to be just like it. Today, I'm here to explore the magic of Coraline. Coraline has been a part of my family's DVD collection for as long as I can remember. I'm not sure exactly when we acquired it, I just know that my sister and I watched it many, many times. And on my sister's bookshelf, I distinctly remember there being a copy of Coraline with little bite marks all over it from our cat. Despite loving this film so much growing up, to the point of even spending a large part of my childhood saying, if I ever had a daughter, I would name her Coraline and no one would ever call her Caroline. I never read the book until researching for this video. Some people consider Coraline to be a scary movie, a horror film for kids, and I always thought it was pretty scary too, but reading the book, now I know it could have been much scarier. Coraline the Book was written by author Neil Gaiman in 1999. He said himself that it was written for his eldest daughter initially, but due to the length of time it took him to complete the book, he finished it for his youngest daughter. He even says in the dedication, I started this for Holly, I finished it for Maddie. The book is about a young girl who is experiencing some frustration with her family life at home when she discovers a portal to another world that's a lot like her own, but vastly more interesting. Neil Gaiman says that the setting for Coraline is based on a home that his family lived in when his eldest daughter was young. It's a house similar to Coraline's because it was once a large house that had been separated into multiple flats. And in his flat, there was a door that when you opened, led to a brick wall, much like the one in Coraline. This door sparked Neil's imagination and he began to think about where that door could possibly go. The dark and creepy nature of the book was inspired not only by his own fascination with the macabre, but also his daughter's. She was also interested in all things spooky and creepy. The dark themes in the story also make it appealing for people of all ages. Neil also doesn't believe in the idea of children's books, just good stories. Here's a quote from him addressing this very subject. In order for stories to work, for kids and for adults, they should scare. And you should triumph. There's no point in triumphing over evil if the evil isn't scary. The book is considered a novella due to it only being 160 pages long, and it's a very short story which you can read in about three hours depending upon your speed. The story feels pretty complete with the ending, but it does feel as if you're dropped into the story suddenly that's already in progress. Within the first seven pages, Coraline has already opened the not-so-little door, and this is where I'd like to explore some of the differences between the book and the movie. In the book, there's a very short introduction. Coraline has already been transported into the other world within just a few pages of the book, and also very early on in the book, after her first visit with the other mother, her parents have already gone missing. This makes me appreciate the exposition in the beginning of the film where we get to see the pink palace and get a feel for her parents, what they do for work. In the book, her father's work is only mentioned briefly as something on computers, and Coraline's parents are not fully fleshed out characters. Neil Gaiman may have done this purposefully so kids reading could more easily put themselves in Coraline's shoes and relate to the idea of parents being too busy for their kids without going into specifics. In the film, we also get an introduction to everyone that lives in and near the Pink Palace. The neighbors are described in much less detail in the book. Coraline never enters Babinski's flat in the book and doesn't even learn his name until the last few pages of the book, and it's Mr. Bobo. The wonders in the book are also very different. Instead of an honestly borderline inappropriate and kind of disturbing burlesque fine art performance as we see with Mrs. Spink and Miss Forcible in the film, in the book their performance is more of a magician or circus type performance with a dagger throwing feet at Coraline's head. During this scene in the book, Coraline is given a small box of chocolates for her participation in the performance, 
which I strongly suspect are bugs, as it specifically says she's eating them in the dark and can't really see what they are. Oh, and the Scotty dogs can talk. There are no adorable mice in the book. They are instead just rats that sing to Coraline in a chorus very creepily. And Coraline does not go to Babinski's flat to see the rats perform. I prefer the book version of events with the old dingback neighbors, but I very much prefer the movie's version of the mouse circus. Unfortunately, one of my favorite scenes in the movie was actually just made up for the movie, and that's the beautiful garden scene. Overall, the other father is given much more personality and character in the film than in the book as he tries desperately to help Coraline against the other mother's wishes, and in the book, this isn't a thing. He's punished by the other mother for saying too much by being turned into a blob of dough, but he wasn't intentionally trying to help Coraline. In fact, he continues to do the other mother's bidding long after his punishment and attempts to attack Coraline. When researching for this video, I found out that Neil Gaiman initially named her Caroline, and he kept making the same typo and typing it as Coraline. And he said the longer he looked at it, the more he knew that that had to be someone's name, and that's where her name came from. One of my favorite characters in the movie is Wybie. He does not appear in the book, and he's only in the film. The director, Henry Selick, says that he added him so Coraline would have someone to talk to and bounce ideas off of, as there's many times in the book where Coraline is thinking or talking to herself and it wouldn't have translated as well to film. I love his addition to the film. He not only fills out more time, but gives us someone else to root for and stand by Coraline's side. He's one of the few things that we see in the other world that feels comforting and not unsettling. In the book, the other world feels wrong from the start. Coraline describes things as being more interesting, but not exactly better. Like her bedroom, for example. In the other world, the walls are green and pink. And they're not colors she would have picked for herself, but definitely more interesting than her room in her real house. The director, Henry Selick, did this intentionally. He wanted to give a slow swell of horror elements and make the other world more appealing in the beginning of the film, which was an excellent choice. In the book, Coraline is never tempted to stay in the other world and never remotely falls for the other mother's tricks. So her being so amazed by it in the film during her first visit adds a layer of complexity and conflict that's not present in the book. One way that Henry Selick accomplished this was by making Coraline's other mother and father nearly identical to her real parents. The only real distinction in the beginning of the film is the button eyes and the other mother's ever-moving fingers. In the book, Coraline notes differences in their appearances from the very beginning, including the other mother being paler, taller, and having two long teeth and fingers. Selick's choice to make the other mother look more identical to her real mom in the beginning of the film makes it that much more disturbing when she transforms into her true form later. When writing the screenplay for the film, at first, Henry Selick was working closely with Neil Gaiman and speaking to him often, and this wasn't working. He was struggling to achieve a full-length film and trying too hard to stay true to the original source material. At some point in the early development when he was struggling, Neil Gaiman told him they needed to stop talking so Henry Selick could come up with his own vision and stop worrying so much about Neil's input and staying true to the book, and this turned out to be a great success. Gaiman was thrilled with the final result and initially didn't see how Selick could make such a short story into a full-length film. To this day, Neil Gaiman says Coraline is his favorite film or visual adaptation of any of his works. This strategy had worked well for Henry Selick in the past with Nightmare Before Christmas. It was written by Tim Burton and he was in a completely different city at the time of the creation of the film working on Batman. And Selick has said that that level of trust and allowing him to develop his own vision for the project is what allowed it to be successful. When researching for this video, I was awestruck at the behind the scenes footage of the stop motion animation and the sheer scale of some of the sets. 
Seeing the crew walking through them or climbing atop them really gives you a new appreciation for the scale of this project. It was filmed in a massive warehouse, and at one point they had up to 30 sets all operating simultaneously. This not only gave me a new appreciation for the film, but so many that came out during this time. I didn't even realize it until diving into this medium that I love stop motion animation and I've always had a fondness for it. Around the time of this movie release, I was also obsessed with Wallace and Gromit and The Curse of the Were-Rabbit and Chicken Run. Even into adulthood, I've continued to adore movies in this genre like The Fantastic Mr. Fox or Isle of Dogs. They're total masterpieces. Now knowing what a spectacular labor of love these films are, I love them even more. One example I read was to create a simple dialogue scene for Coraline, over 100 different faces were used to create her different expressions. If you're interested in seeing more behind the scenes of how Coraline was made, and exactly what processes they used to execute the stop motion animation style, Leica Studios, which is the production company that made Coraline, has a video series on their YouTube channel that shows in greater detail the extensive attention to detail and the importance of the minutia of creating these spectacular scenes in Coraline. One of the videos in particular shows seven to eight minutes worth of work that goes into animating a single frame. And it goes on to explain that there are 24 frames in every single second of the movie. Isn't that incredible? Something else that's really special about the stop motion animation in Coraline is the costume design. The costumes were all designed by a woman named Deb Cook, and some of them are more standard, but the knitted works, she actually knits with thread that's thinner than human hair, and watching footage of her knitting these pieces is absolutely incredible and mind-blowing. She says that some of her sweaters take up to six months to complete. She also details the lengths they went to to change the other mother's appearance from her pristine appearance in Coraline's first interaction with her and how she is in every way an improved version of Coraline's real mother, with more tight-fitting clothing, a less disheveled look, and even her neck brace has been transformed into a turtleneck sweater, which I think is really impactful because evidenced by a scene earlier in the film, it's clear that Coraline despises that car wreck that happened to her family. In the first costume we see the other mother in, her sweater was actually made out of a child's sock. Also, the transformation from the innocent-looking other mother to the spider-like beldum she even talks about the peplum, which is the large portion of her dress on her bottom, and how they made it evolve as the movie continues to emphasize her metamorphosis into a more insect-like creature. There is so much subtlety in her costume changes throughout the film that I frankly had never noticed before. One of my favorite costumes in the movie has always been the star-studded sweater that Coraline wears when attending the mouse circus with YB. For years and years, I have hoped that I would magically find a sweater just like that one in real life. Now knowing that it was knitted from thread the size of human hair, I am a little less hopeful I will ever find one just like it. Although I have managed to find the swampers and raincoat just like hers. Knowing what I know now, going back and watching a scene such as the one where Coraline accidentally turned on the shower and got her hair wet. Just looking at that scene, I can now appreciate exactly how many people it took to make that vision a reality. There were separate people on staff to create and style Coraline's hair going through the various stages of it becoming wet, to create the water that comes from the shower faucet, to create the set, the puppet itself, and also to create Coraline's clothing, and not to mention all the people that were responsible for staging and animation and filming it once it had been created. Honestly, there are probably even more roles that I'm not even thinking of. It's easy to see when watching something special if it was a labor of love, and indeed I do feel that way when watching Coraline. Looking back at behind-the-scenes interviews with the staff, no matter what their role on the project, it seems like they were all very passionate about Coraline. And it's easy to see from watching Coraline that Henry Selick had a great amount of care for this project, and he had a very unique voice and distinct vision too. Something special about this is when watching The Nightmare Before Christmas, 
probably his most well-known movie, it's easy to see that he's doing his best to mimic Tim Burton's style, which he does spectacularly well. But in Coraline, he has his own unique voice, and there's something even more magical about that. His unique voice is seen in the seemingly most simple of choices, such as the color palette in the real world and how it seems to be muted in color. Everything is neutral and gray, and even the boring blue boy with his ice cream appears to be uninteresting for some reason or another. Then when we step into the other world, everything is much more colorful and vibrant. The food looks delicious, the flowers light up and glow, and everything is just more fantastic than it was before. I have seen this time and time again compared to The Wizard of Oz when Dorothy steps through the doorway into the world of color when her real life was in black and white. I think this is a good comparison, but maybe not enough. Coraline is even more fantastic and is even more of an amazing artistic choice in the differences because it's not as stark as black and white to color. It's more subtle, and the subtlety makes it easier to digest, harder to consciously realize, and overall a much more intelligent artistic choice. Watching this film again through the lens of research and taking notes, trying to remember as many things as I could to make the video and make it all make sense, I noticed something really cool that I think is a perfect example of the difference between the real world and the other world. It's the scene towards the beginning of the movie when Coraline is placing seed packets in the window and talking to her mom about how she wants to plant them so they'll be growing by the time her friends come to visit her. I think that this is a perfect example of seeing the world through the eyes of a child. When you're a kid, it's hard to understand priorities, time management, and why your parents could possibly think that typing on their computers is more important than starting the garden you've been waiting for for a long time. But in the other world, the garden is already completely in bloom. Everything is perfect and beautiful, and Coraline is amazed and awestruck when she sees it. I think that this illustrates that when we're kids, we have a tendency to want everything right now and never want to wait or work for it. And she sees the beautiful garden that she didn't have to do anything to create. It's already there right in front of her. And I think that teaches her a powerful lesson that doing things on your own and waiting and taking time to do them the right way is more impactful and more satisfying. We see this at the end of the movie when she's planting the garden with all of her family and friends. They're planting tulips, not even the flowers or vegetables that she chose at the beginning of the movie, but she's so much happier to be doing it with the people that love and care about her. This is an important lesson to learn in life and one I don't think necessarily that Neil Gaiman intended for us to learn in the book. I really think that this is a Henry Selleck specific theme that he introduced, but it's one that's so beautiful. Off subject, but while we're talking about the scene where she puts the seeds in the window, have you ever noticed that the seeds that she puts in the windowsill are all the flowers and vegetables that you see again later in the beautiful garden in the other world? Speaking of things that Henry Selleck added to the movie, let's talk about how the other mother could have possibly known that Coraline wanted those specific plants in her garden. Well, it's the doll. In the movie, the doll acts as a spy, and we see the other mother sewing it to look exactly like Coraline in the beginning, changing it from how it used to look, which was Wybie's great aunt, one of the ghost children that we see later. I think that the doll was added to give more weight to the feelings of childhood in the movie. We see in a few scenes during the beginning of the movie that Coraline is interacting with her parents or becoming frustrated, then she will turn to the doll and speak to it, or the scene where they're all sitting down for dinner and she sits the Coraline doll in a chair right next to her as if she was a real person. I think that that symbolizes the stage of life that Coraline is in, that pre-adolescent stage where girls begin to figure out their independence and find their own voice and want to be treated like an adult, but they're still childlike enough to want to play with dolls. In the book, the other mother has spies as well, but her spies are the rats. And Henry Selleck's desire to keep the movie more playful and innocent in the beginning, I think it would have been disrupted by ugly rats spying on Coraline rather than an adorable doll. 
The doll also serves as a warning sign later when Coraline finds the doll has been turned into her mother and father, and it gives her the clue that they've been kidnapped and are being held in the other world. Now in the book, it's never a question, because Coraline never likes the other mother. She suspects her from the beginning, and she knows that she's using it as a tactic to trick her into coming back to the world permanently. She never thinks for one second that the other mother is a good guy. I think that Henry Selleck also worked to make Coraline more relatable in the beginning of the movie to audiences, and one of the ways he did this is by making her father's cooking disgusting. Now in the book, his cooking sounds fabulous. It describes a potato and leek stew with a tarragon garnish, and he's made it from a recipe, and Coraline says, you've been making recipes again, haven't you? And Neil Gaiman says that this was a reenactment of a scene that had happened with his own son in real life. Coraline in the book is just a picky eater, and later when she's in the other world, we learn that her favorite food to eat is a cheese omelet, which is a very common preferred food for picky eaters. Now, I think a lot of people can relate to being a picky eater when they were a child, but isn't it even more relatable to many people to just remember your parents being a bad cook and having to eat disgusting food? Another change that Henry Selleck made is that the other mother is not helpful to Coraline in the end. And the end of the book where Coraline makes a deal with her other mother, the other mother swears on her mother's grave that she will hold up her end of the bargain. If Coraline finds the ghost eyes and her parents, Coraline tells her, I don't believe you. And the other mother says one of the creepiest things in the entire book. She says, well, I put her there myself. And then when she crawled out, I put her there again reinforcing the fact that she is indeed a murderer. And instead, Coraline gets her to agree to make the deal and bet on her right hand that she will release Coraline if she's able to find the ghost children's eyes and her parents. And this is why her right hand is what comes after Coraline after she's escaped, because she lost it in the bet. Now also, these three wonders I've made for you, I've hidden one of the eyes, that is a made up thing for the movie. Coraline's mother does not give her a hint, and one of the wonders, like the garden, doesn't even exist in the book. So let's explore why Henry Selleck would include these things. Why would he change the bet and the negotiation and make the other mother help Coraline instead of trying to hurt her? I think overall he wanted the movie to be more along the lines of you can catch more flies with honey than you can with vinegar. And this is evident from the very beginning of Coraline's time in the other world, and it's echoed throughout the entire movie then solidified when the other mother turns into a spider-like creature with a web. Coraline truly is her prey or the fly in this situation, and she time and time again attempts to entrap her with honey, sweet, sugary, beautiful things rather than vinegar. Now in the book, she uses threats of violence and kidnaps her parents right away, so it, it's very different. Something that was changed for the film adaptation of the story that I think is primarily for enhancing the visual appeal of the movie is towards the end of the book when the other mother's world starts to crumble and fall apart, instead of things fading away and disintegrating like they do in the movie or seeming to lose power and energy such as the other father or the theater that Miss Spink and Miss Forcible performed in, Things begin to decay and rot, as if they have died and are made of real organic matter. Things begin to bloat and fall apart. And not only is that going to be an unpleasant thing to look at and kind of not appropriate for kids to watch, it also just doesn't feel quite right. In this world that's meant to reflect a complete figment of Coraline's imagination and everything is not real and fabricated by the other mother, why should we believe that it would be made out of flesh and bone? It makes a lot more sense that things would be made out of a destructible material like they are in the movie. One thing that remains exactly the same from the book to the movie is the cat. Even his dialogue is word for word in some scenes, which I think emphasizes the importance of his role in the story and as a spirit guide to Coraline. Black cats have been a symbol for bad luck for hundreds of years, and they even have a hard time getting adopted. As one 2013 study found, black cats, regardless of age or sex, take the longest time to adopt, followed by cats that are mostly black. 
Black cats were associated with witchcraft, specifically being suspected of being familiars for the witches or shape-shifting witches themselves. Black cats were a symbol of Satan during the Renaissance, and cats were killed throughout Western Europe to drive out the devil, particularly during Lent. Before they were persecuted, though, cats had a reputation for being protectors and companions in Europe, friends of the gods in ancient Egypt, and simply warding off pests from your farmland. The goddess Bastet from ancient Egypt was a cat-headed deity often depicted as being black in color or as a black cat. And Bastet's message is one of home, femininity, and magic. So what can we decipher from all of this symbolism? I think that the cat symbolizes Coraline's intuition and her inner voice. This is seen when in the beginning of the film, she shoos away the cat calls it names, and associates it with this place she doesn't want to be in. While she's not listening to the cat or paying it any attention, everything seems to be going wrong, but once she starts letting the cat into her life and listening to what the cat has to say, she's able to defeat the other mother, save her parents, and free the souls of the ghost children. A metaphor for the benefits that can be found when you listen to your intuition or inner voice and stand up for what your gut is telling you. There are many more small differences between the book and the movie, such as the size of the door between the worlds, the ending of the book, and one of the ghost children is actually a fairy. I think this serves two purposes, to show how old the beldam is and to give us a glimpse into the fairy tales and folklore that may have inspired this magical universe. More on that later. None of the other differences feel quite as important to mention as the ones we've talked about so far. Okay, so now that we've talked about the film and the book in great detail, I want to explore some of my own personal takeaways about the creepy cozy aesthetic and why this story has such a wide-reaching appeal. The creepy cozy aesthetic is kind of hard to define, but you know it when you see it, or rather when you feel it. Coraline encapsulates this feeling so well. From the time that she spends in her big empty house to the magical and horrific journey in the other world. Something about this movie just makes you want to put it on on every gray rainy day and curl up in a blanket while you watch it. It goes far beyond being just a Halloween movie. The combination of the muted colors and the rich looking textures in the fabric that look like you could climb right into the screen and the calm yet eerie soundtrack all work together to make you feel like you wish you could be in the pink palace with the characters. Another one of my favorite things, which I've also made a video essay on, is Over the Garden Wall, and I feel like that animated masterpiece also perfectly encapsulates this feeling and aesthetic. It seems to be rare, but I love it when a piece of media gets it just right. I don't get the same feeling from other of Selleck's films, like The Nightmare Before Christmas. I think part of the cozy feeling that comes with some horror is similar to the relaxing relaxing feeling of laying in bed and listening to the sounds of a thunderstorm, or watching your room light up with flashes of lightning. There's an imminent danger outside, but you know you're safe from it, tucked in your bed. And the same feeling comes with watching Coraline. There's also something so relatable with Coraline and the feeling of isolation and loneliness. For the majority of the book, her only companion or help she has for most of her journey is the cat and he's a very reluctant companion at that. When her parents have been captured and she's in her huge house all alone, there's something inviting about it, even though it should feel sad. I don't know, maybe it's a longing to be there with Coraline and explore the world with her. I've noticed through this process of making YouTube videos over the media that I love that I have a tendency to relate so strongly with adolescent or pre-adolescent girl characters in media because it's just such a difficult and transitional time of life. It was a time in my life where I felt like I had no control over anything and I asserted control by being rebellious, inquisitive, and contrary to all adults and authority figures in my life. For girls and women, this is universally one of the most difficult times in our lives and often the smallest conflicts and issues can feel enormous. Something else that often happens during this stage of life is a dramatic shift in the mother-daughter relationship, usually for the worst. My father once described this time as a baby bird making the mother bird hate them so she would allow the baby bird to leave the nest. 
It's as if to gain autonomy and independence, adolescent girls must cause a divide between them and their mothers. Due to my experience and the understanding I have of other women's experience of this time of life, I'm truly struck in awe of the dynamic of the other mother and the ultimately happy ending and reuniting of Coraline and her mother at the end. During this time of life being an adolescent girl, it truly feels like your mother has turned against you at times and maybe that she's become a completely different person. But in reality, you are the one who is changing. Sometime after this transitional phase of life, it's different for different people, but eventually you come to understand your mother and where she was coming from. It's almost as if she's gone back to normal, like how we see Coraline's mom in the end of the film. Speaking about the other mother, she's referred to as a beldam in the book and in the movie. I've watched so many YouTube videos at this point, where they just Google Beldum and screenshot the definition and put it on screen and say it means old hag or witch. I think this is a little too surface level of a definition. If you dig deeper, Beldum actually lines up way more with fairy folklore than that of witches. Fairies in folklore are often ugly creatures who cast glamour spells on themselves or on other things to trick people. In this case, she would have been using a glamour spell to make the other world as well as herself and her creations more appealing and appear more welcoming to Coraline. It's emphasized in the original book that eating the food the other mother serves is highly dangerous and eating it makes Coraline's head feel fuzzy and makes her less able to see through the Beldum's illusions. It's also worth noting that Coraline stresses that the food seems better in the other world. This correlates to fairy folklore as it's believed that eating the food from the fairy world is terribly dangerous and the consequences range from being trapped in the fairy realm forever to turning into some sort of animal or never being satisfied with the food from the human realm again. The fact that the first thing that the other mother did upon Coraline's arrival was serve her a meal only proves this point further as the food may give the other mother a certain power over Coraline. The stone that Coraline uses to look through to find the ghost children's eyes is an aider stone. An aider stone is a type of stone usually glassy with a naturally occurring hole through it. Such stones with holes are also known as hag stones, witch stones, or fairy stones. These stones are believed to ward off evil and in the book, reference is made to this when Coraline clutches the stone in her hand to protect herself. Looking through the hole of an eater stone is also believed to grant the user the ability to see through false illusions and find real things, something that Coraline did in her search for the lost children's souls and for her parents. As far as the name of the Beldum herself, I love that this is a name that I've never heard in any other stories. I think Neil Gaiman may have chosen the name due to the possible meaning taken from the French words belle and dame, which means beautiful woman. There are also other connotations such as the belle mare, which usually translates to beautiful mother, but also can mean stepmother, which what does that tell you, other mother, right? I think this theory carries even more weight when you take into consideration that Neil Gaiman speaks French although admittedly not super well, as stated in a quote here. I've leftover schoolboy French still in there somewhere, and it surfaces after a few days in France. German, it's down deep, but turns up when needed, and a little Latin and less Greek. He also references and uses French in some of his other works, like The Sandman. These influences could very well have inspired Neil Gaiman in his writing. Well, there you have it everything you ever needed to know about Coraline. The movie and the book alike have inspired so many people and artists over the years and are both special and inspirational in their own right, but even more so when you compare the two. I am so grateful for them both and I have gained a new appreciation for them knowing so much more. If you made it this far in the video, I really appreciate your time and I hope you do something today that makes you happy. See you later. Bye. Making up a song about Coraline. She's a peach, she's a doll, she's a pal of mine. She's a button in the eyes of everyone who ever laid their eyes on Coraline.